Hello everyone, it is Caitlin and today we're going to talk about building a basic 1830s working woman's wardrobe. Alright, let's get started. So I have dogs over here because I'm talking and they love that I talk. So I'm sorry if you hear feet. I got a new kitten, so if she shows up, I'll show her on screen. But she was eating a second ago, so I don't think she'll make it. But let's go ahead and get started and talk about building a basic 1830s wardrobe for a working woman. So like the average woman of the 19th century, the vast majority of women in the 19th century were working class women. So let's go ahead and get started. The very first article of clothing we're going to talk about is the shift. And I just got back from an event a couple days ago, so all my stuff is wrinkled because I have washed it and not ironed it. And I'm going to apologize ahead of time and turn it right side out for you. But this is what a shift looks like. And here's Stella. Everyone say hi to Stella. This is a baby. She kind of fell on my lap, but she's mine now. So that's Stella. Let's go ahead and get back and get started. Um, this shift happens to be linen. Linen is a good option for shifts, so it's cotton. Um, actually, I think this one's a cotton linen blend, which is also appropriate. Um, this is a Regency style one, so it's a little bit earlier. Uh, you see this a lot in the 1820s, and you still see them in the 1830s. The Work Woman's Guide, which was published in 38, shows this exact pattern, so it's still appropriate even in the later 1830s. And it's a very simple style to make very little waste when you cut them. It's basically squares, rectangles, and triangles, and that's all it is. So it does make it very easy to make. A shift has many purposes. Um, purpose number one is this going to go get damp with sweat and it'll keep that cool damp cloth next to your skin and it definitely helps to keep you cool. Purpose number two is that when you're lacing your corset you won't get rope burns or anything when you're lacing a corset. Um, shifts come in handy for that. Shifts will also help keep the rest of your garments clean so that they don't get sweat and body oils on them. These are easy to launder. So um, this one happens to be based off a um, 1820s to early 1830s original shift in my collection and so it has my initials on it and everything just like the original did uh, and I hand stitched it just like the original so that's this one and they should fall around a uh, mid calf um, they should fall about mid calf on uh, on you whenever you know they're made up so shift is number one piece number two is the controversial bit the corset or the stays although I say stays is probably a bit more common in this time period. These are my working stays. And yes, you're going to want them. Yes, you're going to wear them. Uh, what makes them working is that there is little boning. Uh, most of the bones are in the back because I personally am bending over a hearth when I do 1830s working stuff. Um, I'm going to bone cookie now. I'll fix that later. But um, yeah. So most of my boning is in the back because I like the back support bending over a hearth. And then the rest of the boning is up here with the bust trying to get this um, to stay up. Very lots and lots of cording in the bust because my bust won't stay up unless every single bit is corded. And then a little bit of cording down here and down here. There's a wooden bust down the center that's going to help support everything. And then there are shoulder straps in this time period. It is absolutely 100% possible to lace yourself in a corset in the 1830s. Um, there are a couple ways to do it. One is to pre-lace it, which a lot of people like to do, and then you put it over your head and then you lace it up. I'm not personally a fan of that method. I'm trying to unlace it so I can show y'all what I do. Option two is what I do, which is to put the corset on like this, lace it up, and then turn it, adjust everything, put the straps on and then tighten it. That works really well for me. Um, the other option is to have a husband or a sister or a friend or somebody else place your corset for you. You do want them. They are excellent back support and you need them when you're wearing, you know, 12 yards of fabric, 15 yards of fabric. It's going to help keep all that weight from your hips and um, just it's going to be a great support garment. Uh, support for your bust and also for all the fabric underneath. So they are not necessarily optional in this time period. If you're building a wardrobe for just for fun, you're not a living historian, you're just a costumer, by all means do whatever you want. Um, if you are a historian and you are doing this with, and you are in the public's eye and showing them this is what they did back then, this is how they dressed, 
you need to be doing it correctly. We owe it to the public not to lie to them, but to give them historical fact as close as we can recreate it. We are never going to be 100%. That is going to be a given. We should be as close as we physically can. Um, as far as corsetry, were there women who were not wearing corsets in the early 19th century? Yes. Um, very, very, very few. And my philosophy on doing unusual things with living history is I am one person. However, I am not representing one person in the 19th century. If there is, let's say we're doing a town, um, a little village event, and there's 20 living historians. Well, let's just say in our hypothetical little world here that in the 1830s, there was 2,000 people who lived in this town. Children don't exist in our hypothetical world. So 1,000 of them are women, and let's say there's 10 female living historians. That means every one of those women is portraying 100 people from the 1830s. Were 100 people not wearing their stays? No, <laughs> they were not, as evidenced by paintings and uh, literature and that sort of thing. They, there may have been one, there may have been two, but 100? No. So we need to be portraying as close as, to the majority as possible. We need to say that this is what my 100 women would have most likely been wearing. And so that's basically my little spiel on doing what was common um, and not going towards the unusual. The only time I think doing the unusual is acceptable is when we are portraying a particular person who did something unusual. In that case, you have evidence that, oh, this person did this. We have evidence they did this. They were the only person in the town that did this, but I am this person, so I'm going to do this because that person did this. Um, that's the only time this is really acceptable. If you are someone who doesn't like tight clothing, um, don't use boning. Use just cording. There are plenty of extant corsets that have just cording in them. All a corset is is going to, is going to provide a base for this petticoat. It's going to support your bust. You do not have to have the boning in that if that's what makes you uncomfortable. You can completely do it with just cording. So don't feel like this boning bit is what's holding you back. Um, if you can handle the tight-fitted bodices of the 1830s, you can handle stays. Not necessarily you have to be boned stays, but you can handle stays. If you're um, like me and you're doing a lot of heavy work, you were going to want the support, I would suggest boning. Um, I use German plastic whalebone because it is the closest thing to whalebone that we can get because <laughs> hunting whales is illegal now. So we don't get real whalebone, we get the German plastic stuff, which mimics real whalebone very well. Um, and it is very flexible and bending. I, it's not gonna hurt you, I promise. But yeah, stays are a must. Fully corded if that's what you're gonna go for and you don't feel comfortable in boning, but you still need to be wearing stays. Um, this is the bra of the 19th century. This is going to be your support. It's gonna help you not look as frumpy. You're gonna want these. And if you're doing hard, heavy labor, I highly suggest a boned one as opposed to just corded. But if you don't feel comfortable boned, go for fully corded. That's perfectly acceptable. Footwear. Stockings. White cotton is going to be your best bet. You went just slightly over knee high to mid thigh high. Cotton, knit stockings are going to be your best bet for everyday wear. A lot of them won't stay up on their own, like these will not stay up. Garters super helpful. These are just knitted ones. Those are really easy to whip up. You can also do embroidered ones or ribbon ones. It's up to you. Um, shoes in this time period. I would highly suggest boots for working wear because they're going to be more sturdy than say just a shoe. Um, these are from, oh gosh, Amazon Dry Goods. Not the hugest fan of the, of the heel. I would prefer it to be half the, um, the length that it is or the height that it is, that's the word I was looking for. Because um, you do see very flat shoes for the 1830s. I'm working on making my own so that um, I can have something that's a little bit closer. But these are side lacers. You do see side lacers in the 1830s. They're a really good option. The heel isn't perfect, but they're, they're a good option. And after we have on our shift and our corsets and our footwear, we're gonna need petticoats. Lots and lots of petticoats, because we like full skirts in the 30s. Now for working wear, you're not going to wear as many petticoats as you would fashion wear, but you should still have at least two, preferably three, petticoats on for the 1830s. Um, petticoats can be several different types. 
The most common type, if I remembered it, yes I did, is going to be white cotton. Yes, it does seem counterintuitive to have white for working because white gets dirty. In the 19th century, we have something called blue ink, which also seems counterintuitive, but it, that blue ink makes things white, but it does. And um, yeah, and then once you starch them, the starch will help repel dirt just a little bit. So um, white cotton is going to be your base petticoats um, for a lot of things. You want to want them about mid-calf, um, at least the first one. The first one's going to be about mid-calf on you and um, and moderately full 90 to 110 inches wide somewhere in there um, on the bottom circumference and they're just the rectangles in this time period and then gathered to a waistband they're super simple if you're just learning to sew petticoats are really really easy to learn uh, now you don't have to do white cotton in fact sometimes when i'm working i don't wear a lot of white cotton a uh, very common practice in the 19th century is to reuse old fabric. So this one is an 18th century patterned fabric that I made into a petticoat. So like this was an older skirt that um, I can't resell into the second hand market because the fabric is too out of date. No one's going to buy it. And so I'm going to use this fabric in making a petticoat. So this is a working class petticoat and it's really dark and it doesn't show stains and that sort of thing. So we do have that option as well. If you're working somewhere that's really cold, um, wool petticoats are always an option. Quilted petticoats, either quilted silk or quilted wool, also very appropriate. A lot of work, but they're appropriate. But um, yeah, petticoats are the way to go. Just put on an extra petticoat, you feel a little bit more exposed. But this shift should, uh, should cover you um, one base lever, one base petticoat, and then an upper petticoat or two should be good. If you're doing something a little bit more fashionable or uh, you're just playing working class but you're in town not doing hard heavy labor, an easy way to get some poof is a corded petticoat. This is mine. It has lots and lots of sugar and cream cotton yarn sewn into the petticoat. This is actually my 1850s petticoat or my 1850s corded petticoat. So it's machine done, not hand done like everything else that I'm showing you. Um, I am working on an 1830s corded petticoat. It's just not done yet. So I brought out my 1850s one to show you. And it's heavily starched and it gives you some really good poof because this extra cording in the hem of it really does help poof everything out. But it's not required. This is like the best thing ever. This is a wool petticoat, um, which is my topmost petticoat. So I almost always, for working class situations, will wear, actually I really always wear, it's not even almost always, it's always, I will always wear a wool petticoat in working class situations as my topmost petticoat. Um, this coat was, this in the 19th century was probably something that they would have used um, an older dress for because wool wears like iron and you're gonna, yes, this, and your bodice style is gonna be way out of date but your fabric's still really, really good. If you don't have any little kids to cut up a new dress from, this is a really good way to reuse fabric. This particular fabric I bought specifically to be a petticoat because I don't do this every day and I don't wear out my clothes enough to, to be able to quickly have a petticoat from an old skirt. Um, I found this fabric. I really, really loved it. Unfortunately, I don't wear yellow well and so I can't wear it near my face, but I thought, ooh, petticoat, that's not anywhere near my face. I can still wear the pretty fabric. So I have my wool petticoat that's plaid. It's wonderful. Uh, my top, the topmost petticoat is going to be uh, two or so inches um, above where your bottom of your skirt's going to hit. Oops, sorry, Stella. Hit you with a petticoat. And that's going to keep it from really um, showing through on the bottom of your skirt. You do want your petticoats shorter than your skirt so they don't show through. Um, why wear wool for an uppermost petticoat? There are lots of reasons to wear wool. I'm so glad you asked. Uh, wool is hard wearing. It's not going to wear down as easy. It's not going to fade as easy. It's it's going to really, it's going to wear really well. And if you're working hard on a farm, if you're bending over a hearth, this is going to be excellent for that. Uh, wool is also dirt resistant. If it gets muddy, you wait till it dries, you can brush the, the mud off and it comes off really easily. It's also water resistant, so it doesn't get wet. You're not going to get drenched in a wool petticoat. Wool is also fire resistant, which is excellent in the 19th century because we have a lot of fire in the 19th century. There are candles everywhere. There's hearths and outdoor ovens and all sorts of ways to catch on fire. 
So a wool petticoat is going to help you not be as, um, it's going to help you be a little bit safer in that respect. Um, I, I do living history in Texas, and yes, I do wear a wool petticoat the vast majority of the time. I have cooked, this is 1870s, so it's, but I still wear my, a, a wool petticoat in the 1870s for cooking. And I have done that in 105 degree heat in a kitchen where someone painted the windows shut so I couldn't open any windows on a wood stove in 105 degree heat all day. It wasn't pleasant, but it's doable. I still wore a wool petticoat and the wool petticoat did not cause me to be any warmer than I otherwise would be. And also because it's wool, I'll use it as a hot pad to like get boiling kettles of water off the stove or off the um, off the hearth. Um, wool is just excellent all around. Highly, highly recommend it. When you're doing working class 19th century, wool and cotton is going to make up your, basically your entire wardrobe. All right, almost done with underpinnings. Almost. Pockets. Pockets are so cool. We love pockets in the 21st century, and so did the people in the 19th century. Pockets are wonderful. Um, you are often finding things you need to carry around and you and if you're doing a lot of heavy work you don't actually have the hand space to carry a bag or anything like that pockets are excellent and they are underwear even though they are pretty sometimes they are still underwear this one happens to be based off an extant one in a private collection it was just plain cotton um, fabric that was probably left over from an old dress or something um, you also see them, if you don't have enough fabric to make one, you see them patchworked. You see them in white, plain cotton or linen. Um, you see them embroidered heavily with silk. Um, lots and lots of pocket options. But the same basic shape. Pockets, very helpful. I like to make two pockets, so we have a pair of pockets. Um, and you can put them on the same tape. I just sometimes wear one and sometimes wear two. So I put them on separate tapes so that I can just decide on the day whether I want two pockets or one pocket. You are going to need to make a slit into your dress to be able to access this. Um, as far as putting pockets into dresses in the 1830s, I cannot find evidence of that. The closest thing I can find is the Workwoman's Guide, which is British and also 38, um, does mention putting, pe putting pockets into petticoats. Have you ever heard the rhyme, Lucy Lockett lost her pocket and Kitty Fisher found it? Not a penny was there in it, only the ribbon around it. Makes a lot more sense when you realize that pockets are not attached to anything in this time period. It's very easy to lose a pocket if you don't tie it on securely. So do tie it on securely when you're wearing one, but pockets are excellent. All right, now we've come to the part where um, basically we're at the dress. Not quite though. So if you have a dress with an open neckline, you're probably going to want some sort of neckerchief. This one happens to be from Burnley and Trowbridge. There's a couple ways to wear neckerchiefs. You can't put them on underneath and put the dress on top. Or you can put the dress on and then put this over top. Um, it doesn't matter either way is appropriate. You see both in portraiture. Um, neckerchiefs serve a couple of purposes. So if you have a lower neckline, it's going to fill in that neckline, um, mostly for sun protection. They're also really nice. If it's really hot, you can like dip them into water and wring them out and put them back on and they feel amazing. <laughs> Makes you feel like a whole new human being because it, it just cools you off. So yeah, if you have printed ones, you can have them in plain white cotton, you can have them in plain, you can have them in plain white linen, um, net, nets, one, net ones are really cool, not so great in sun protection, but they're really cool. And um, yeah, the printed ones are good too. If you don't want to wear a neckerchief, you can wear a chemisette. This is one of mine. I think this is actually an 1840s one, but we'll call it good for today. And basically it goes underneath your dress to kind of catch all the sweat. It's another purpose of the, it's another purpose of the neckerchief too, uh, to kind of catch the sweat so it doesn't get on your dress. But it kind of fits over here. We go underneath, it ties at the sides. Mine happens to pin on the front. I didn't put any closures. So it would pin here and then I would tie it here. And then I put the dress on and pull the collar out. It's a nice, neat appearance and collar, um, but it's just a separate garment in this time period. So. Um, if you're doing a lot of sweating, I would suggest either a neckerchief or this, um, unless your dress is easily laundered. But even if your dress is easily laundered, laundering is what makes your fabric not last as long. We call it wearing our fabric out, but we don't wear fabric out. We wash fabric out. That's what's causing all the damage and all the wearing to our fabric is the washing. So you do want to try not to wash your dresses. So we wear a lot of underpinnings 
that are easily washed and very cheap. And then we put the dresses over top of them so we don't have to wash the dresses as often. So once we have either our neckerchief on or our chemisette on, we're ready for the dress. So I brought a couple dresses today. This one's a cotton um, gown. This one closes up the back. Back closing dresses are very common in this time period. They are hard to get into. You might want to have someone help there to help you. Um, you can do front opening gowns. They're not nearly as common. But you have to think this is the 19th century. There's not a lot of women on their own. You either have a husband or a sister or a mother. Someone who can help you out to get dressed. So that makes sense for them back then. But um, basically, this one has a very open neckline. And um, very poofy sleeves in this time period. I'm sorry if we don't get away from that. There are three sleeve options in the 1830s. You can have big giant poof and tight. You can do big giant poof and slightly less poof. Or you can do giant poof all the way down. That's all you get. There's no getting away from the poof in the 1830s. I'm sorry. Even for working class women, you do see very clearly lower class working women with giant sleeves. Working does not mean out of fashion. You ad you took fashion and you still wore it. You just adapted it to your working conditions. There is no reason that you should be wearing a dress that's 10 to 20 years out of date. No reason. First of all, your dress wasn't going to last that long. If you're only getting three, four dresses a year, you're, they're not lasting that long. You're wearing them out, especially if they're cotton, within a year, maybe two years. They're not going to last very long. Wool dresses are going to last forever, but you're going to remake them. Because you're going to grow in sizes, you're going to get pregnant, you're going to lose weight, you're going to gain weight. You're not gonna, they're not going to fit forever. So every once in a while you're going to have to remake the dress. And while you're already cutting it apart, you might as well make it more fashionable, because why not? Um, fashionable makes us look pretty, it makes us feel good, and this is the 19th century. How you dressed determined how people treated you. Dressing respect, dressing well, dressing fashionably, or, or at least tolerably in fashion, meant that you were respectable and a decent person. If you dressed crazy, you were treated like an outcast. So you do have to follow the social structures. And so yes, we are wearing fashionable clothing even when we are working. So this one happens to be really big poof and slightly less poof, um, but still pretty full on the bottom. This makes it really easy to kind of pull it up. Full all the way across, which I do have dresses that are um, basically bishop sleeves, so they're full all the way down, super full all the way down. Um, they're really easy to pull up. The ones that are tight here um, are a little bit harder to pull up, but you can. I'll show you one in just a second. But yeah, you don't get away from poof. Um, poof is pretty in the 1830s. We like poof, so it's okay. Everyone else is going to be in poofy sleeves too. You won't look weird. You'll just look normal. So as far as sleeve supports go, which I have one here, these are sleeve supports. They're very popular in the 30s. They are basically giant pillows for your arms. <laughs> and they fit sort of like this, except you'd put them in before you get dressed because it makes it easier. This one happens to be stuffed with wool. Sometimes you get them stuffed with cotton. Sometimes you see them stuffed with feathers. All things are very readily available on a farm for very cheap or free, but they go into your uh, sleeves here, and when you put them on, you have giant poof. This is very popular. We like giant poof. Um, you would think this would impede you doing work, but it really doesn't. I've cooked over our hearth in this just fine. I'll put a picture here of me cooking bacon and eggs on a hearth in giant poofy sleeves in a really nice dress with curls. Uh, that's not usually how I dress for working but it's possible. Now here on the farm, are you probably going to be wearing sleeve supports? Probably not. There's plenty of painting evidence of women not wearing sleeve supports. They still have the giant sleeves, like they're still fashionable sleeves, but they're drooping. So you're not wearing the sleeve supports. You can also make smaller sleeve supports as well. That does seem to be more personal preference. All right, um, other options for dresses is wool. This is one of mine. This one happens to close up the front. Um, and this is the Gigo sleeves, so it's very full up front or on top and very tight here, um, which is kind of nice for working. And you still can fold them up and then it gets hidden in the giant poof. The giant poof hides it. Um, so, like doing farm labor or that sort of thing. If you're working on a hearth, you do need the sleeves all the way down, um, or at least you should. I don't always, but you should because um, embers and flying things that could hurt you. So this helps. Um, you can have high necklines, you can have low necklines, you can do big poofy all around, mo 
big poof here and small poof here, or um, big poof here and no poof here. Those are your three sleeve options. Neckline options, you can have a um, very low neckline, you can have a very high neckline, you can do something in between. There are lots of options there. Skirt lengths hit around your ankle, a little bit lower, but they are somewhat shorter than what we're used to seeing in the rest of the 19th century, um, which is kind of nice for working. Already fashionable. Uh, if you're working, something that's very useful is an apron. Mine's very wrinkled because it was washed and um, I haven't fixed it. But um, this one happens to be linen. You can do them in cotton as well. Uh, this one has tapes. This is a uh, work woman's guide shows these. And then there's an 18th century apron that has tapes like this. So that's kind of what I did. But um, you can do them. This is just a half apron, so it just sits here. You also see bibbed aprons, which are the ones that go up here and you pin them on. Either is appropriate. I find that I, I'm not a messy cook, so I can get away with just wearing this. Um, some people are messy and they kind of need the bib. Um, before you make your apron, do be aware of a very crucial detail. If you are a front wiper or a side wiper, when you um, wipe things, like, when you wipe your hands on your apron, basically. I'm a front wiper, um, which means I wipe here. If you're a side wiper, make sure your apron goes kind of towards the back so that when you wipe your, on your side, you're still hitting apron and not hitting your skirt. Otherwise, that defeats the purpose of wearing an apron. Let me know in the comments whether you are a front wiper or a side wiper because I kind of find it fascinating that people are so different in those ways. But yeah, aprons, very helpful. Cotton aprons, linen aprons, all the aprons have like several of them because you will get them dirty and you're gonna want another one. And that's basically clothing. As far as how many of everything you need, let's talk about that real quick because that's kind of important. So for chemises or shifts, you want one for every day of your longest event plus an extra. If you do a lot of summer events, when it's 105, 110, hot, hotter than that, you're probably gonna want two per day. Um, because I can tell you nothing feels better than taking off a wet, sweaty chemise, washing yourself off and putting on a new one. It makes you feel like a new human being. So I um, would highly suggest that. Corset, you really only need one of them. Stockings, uh, same rule applies with the shift. One per day plus an extra. Shoes, you can get away with one pair. Garters, you can get away with one pair. I just have a, I have a really bad habit of losing my garters. Um, it's happened multiple times. So I usually bring three or four pair to an event because I will lose them. I always end up finding them. I, like, I haven't lost, I still have all my sets of garters. They just disappear at events and then I find them on pathways and other people will bring them to me. So I bring a lot of garters, but if you're more confident than I am in keeping your garters on, you can get away with one pair. Uh, petticoats is going to depend on uh, how many you want to wear. I wear the same petticoats all weekend long, honestly, and they're not touching my skin anywhere and they're not really touching the ground, so they don't really get dirty per se. Uh, it would be nice to have an extra or two, but what I wear one day, is I usually bring one extra and that's about it. And when I'm working on a hearth, I wear two or three petticoats. So I'll usually bring three or four to an event, um, even if I'm doing it all weekend long. Uh, dresses. My personal opinion on dresses is that you need at least two. You never know when something's going to happen. You never know when you're going to fall into a creep or, you know, spill ink and all down the front of your brand new dress or um, rip out your entire skirt on a doorknob. Not that any of that has ever happened to me, but um, having an extra dress is nice because then you don't feel frantic, say visitors are coming through and you had to strip down to mend your dress or to fix it or to wash it and you're not doing that in your underclothes. You can put on another dress and feel like a human being and then you can just sit down very calmly and be, oh yes, I'm mending today. No particular reason, just, just mending because sometimes I do stupid stuff. I'm sure they did super stuff too and had to mend their dresses because they did stupid stuff. So, um, yeah, fun times. Events are fun. Weird things happen sometimes and yeah, it's just nice to have an extra dress. The only other thing that you're going to really need, and I have a kitten behind me so I'm trying not to squish her, um, are, is headwear. So this is a cap. Caps are very commonly worn in the 1830s by women and girls. It keeps your head clean, your hair clean, keeps your hairstyle nice and neat, um, that sort of thing. So this is a cap and it's not going to fit on my head very well because I didn't put my 1830s hair in today. But essentially, 
it fits like this and you can have ties or not have ties i have ties on here and i don't wear them i usually just leave them like this because i don't like it tied but there we go this is a working woman's cap because it's just trimmed in the fabric itself it's not trimmed in lace or ribbon or anything like that but yeah caps caps are another thing just like the neckerchiefs that you can dip in water wring them out and put them back on your head it feels amazing so little little tricks to keep cool when you're in the 19th century uh, next thing you're going to want is headwear, outdoor headwear. This is a bonnet. This one I made myself. Uh, I don't think the video has come out, but there will be a video on the, me making this and the caps. Um, bonnets in this time frame do look kind of weird to our eye. They are not nice looking bonnets. This one happens to be based off an extant one that's for sale right now, and it would be in my collection right now if it, was, if it weren't you know, $1,500. But I'm going to put this on. Again, it's not going to fit correctly because I don't have my 1830s hair in. But they fit on the top. Move down a little bit. Hair in the 30s is up top. So that's why there's the brim here. Or the crown here. This is the brim. And it does shade my face. Lining in here is cotton because you don't want the straw to catch on your, on your hair. And um, I am working on quilted bonnets as well. You do see some of them quilted um, that are not quite as big. But for winter, you want them kind of closer to your head. There are several in the Met that seem to be dated to the 30s, so I'm, I'm working on one of those too. But I don't have that one yet because I haven't done any cold weather 30 cents and I haven't had need of one. But after that, that's basically all you need to have. Um, that's your basic wardrobe. It's going to be shift, corset, shoes, stockings, uh, petticoats, pocket, dress, bonnet, cap. That's all you really need for an event. Something I highly suggest, highly, highly suggest, is a wrapper. It's like a house coat. And this is mine. I need to make a more working class one. I made this one for fancy stuff. But it's really pretty. It has giant poopy sleeves too. But um, yeah, it's just, these are really nice when you're at an event overnight and the bathrooms are not anywhere near where you're sleeping, which is quite common for events, as it was common for the 19th century, having to go outside for the restroom. Um, getting dressed in the morning where you need to have something on but you're not ready to get fully dressed. Um, this is a this is what you wear. I like to wear my wrapper after the public leaves and I'm done being in a corset. I go take the corset off and I go put this on because it's all it's not fitted, so it doesn't really matter. No one sees anything. So um, wrappers, I highly highly recommend them. I love mine. I have one for every time period that I do. At least one wrapper. So um, this is my 1830s one. I need to make a working class one. That's going to be on the to do pile. I need to buy fabric for that. More fabric! I get to buy more fabric. But yeah, so wrappers, highly recommend them if you're going to do an overnight event. Not required at all. But um, what I would actually suggest is making a dress and then making a wrapper and then a second dress. Because you can always put your wrapper on while mending your other dress if an accident happens. So, highly recommend wrappers. And then there's things that you need to keep warm. So we already kind of talked about uh, quilted petticoats or wool petticoats um, and uh, to bonnets, that sort of thing. An easy, easy thing is a shawl. All you need is two yards of wool. It's about 60 inches wide. Um, so you need 60 inches square. And you can fringe it. You can put little silk edging on it, a little silk fabric to bind it. Uh, you can put fur on the edges. Lots and lots of different ways to trim out shawls. And they are really nice. You, they function as blankets. They, you can wrap a child in them. You can keep yourself warm in them. They also function as sort of a uh, fire uh, extinguisher. So if you have fire kind of somewhere else, you can throw a wool shawl on it and it will usually extinguish the fire. Um, because wool doesn't burn, it will smolder, but it won't burn. So it is very good to have around the fire. But wool shawls usually aren't very expensive because you can just buy two yards of fabric and fringe it. Makes it really easy. Um, super simple project. Anyone can do it. If you need something that's slightly warmer um, for super cold events, cloaks. Sorry, that's the inside of it. Cloaks. Wool cloak here. Um, this one, I had to make my own pattern for. I think I used partially the Work Woman's Guide and partially there was an 18th century um, cloak or an early 19th, it may have been 18-teens cloak um, that kind of, I could see the pattern shape. So I made a cloak. Um, red wool was super popular for cloaks. 
especially in the early 19th century and the late 18th century. So, so red's going to be your most common color. Brown uh, seems to be the next most common color for um, cloaks. So, um, other than that, that's basically all I was going to talk about today. I'm hoping that helps you if you're building an 1830s wardrobe to kind of know what you needed, um, how much of things that you needed. Uh, I will put links below because we made almost all of this on the channel. Um, if it hasn't come out yet, the video will come out eventually. I'll come back to the description and I'll post the video when it does come out. But like I know this isn't out yet. I don't think this drop on is out yet. But most everything we made on the channel. So I'll, I'll link to what we did to, to, so you can kind of see the process involved if you're interested in making your own. As far as purchasing stuff, people go in and out of business so often that I really don't know who sells stuff. And also I make all my own stuff so I really don't know where to buy things. I can give you resources on fabric and I can give you resources on um, patterns, that's about all I got. So I'll link what I do have below um, to help you kind of build your own wardrobe. Other than that, it's going to be you looking at shapes and go find sellers and that sort of thing. So it does seem like a lot and it is a lot. It's, um, it's a fun time period and yes, it looks, looks funny to our eyes, but it, it was fashionable and that's what they wore. So. Um, when you get it all together, it does look really nice and it looks put together. So you do need all the layers to look like you know what you're doing and look like a person from the 1830s. But I'm hoping that helps you and if it did, please uh, like the video, subscribe if you like this type of content. We're going to do more of this, um, more of these how to build wardrobes for the 1840s and 50s and 60s. Thank you.